Hey, y'all, we wanted to invite you to partner with us in this ministry. Preacher's Hour needs your support. In order to make more and better content, we need you, yes, you listening to this right now, to become a patron. Choose the tier that best fits your preferences and help us make theology for our context. Thanks and enjoy this episode. All right, we are back. Uh, this is part two of, yeah, Dr. Mark Baker. Um, I really hope you guys enjoyed the first one. I hope you went out and bought books. You had two weeks to do that. And if you didn't, so it's still in the description. You can still be in the description. All yep. the links will be there. Um, so uh, last episode, we talked about Centered Set Church. Um, there will probably be some overlap, but this one we want to shift a little bit more to talking about discipleship. Um, so I just finished Mark's class called Discipleship and Ethics. Um, John took it as well. And this is like a little bit of background. So going into the class, especially when I heard ethics, I thought, not in a bad way, I'm like, okay, well, we're going to talk about like different scenarios and like right and wrong. Like what should, what's the Christian thing to do in this situation, in this situation. And I was pleasantly surprised that it wasn't that, at all it was more focused on stuff that both john and i have been way more interested in which is like spiritual formation Mm -hmm. character formation like becoming more like jesus so that we can respond in any situation yeah right so we're gonna talk about um and this is stuff that john and i have kind of talked about in the past when we did that live podcast talked about culture and formation but which um, maybe look at the end of this year, we might have another one. We might have another live. Check it out. That went really well. Um, so I want to get your perspective on, like, how the culture, the cultural factors are forming people today, um, and then just like how does that affect, um, the church's discipleship? I mean, f- your experiences being in Fresno for so long and other places and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so let's just first start off with like. How would you define discipleship formation? Um, Maybe what some of these words mean. What do they mean? Are they two different things? Are they the same thing? Are they related? Yeah, okay. So, like um, so yeah, I thought about this when I, when I was working on Center Set Church because I wanted to make connection between well, it's the words in the subtitle, yeah. and so <laughs> okay, but what what do we mean? So I'm going to read my definition from from the book. Um, here of discipleship. So I say, um, discipleship is a formational process. So you can just pause him right there. Formational, I mean, this, the word formational is something that is shaping us. I mean, you, you, you imagine, you know, a, a potter mm-hmm. m- shaping clay into something. So it's forming something or yeah, even, I mean, the, the, building we're sitting in right now the room you know it was formed by mm-hmm. the construction we're mm-hmm. putting things so discipleship is forming a formational process of becoming more christ-like so um, someone who disciples others walks with them towards jesus so a disciple i think if we, if we step start outside the christian realm a disciple is a follower mm-hmm. so uh, so a disciple is someone who is under the influence of uh, being shaped, mentored by someone else. So then taking it in the Christian self, someone who disciples others. So disciple, I'm a disciple of Jesus. We're disciples of Jesus. We're followers of Jesus. But then we use the term, if I'm discipling someone else, then I walk with them toward Jesus. Mm. So they're a disciple of Jesus, but then they can be a disciple of mine mm. as well mm. in that I am helping them in their walk towards Jesus. So um, someone who disciples others walks with them toward Jesus, intentionally sharing life with them. And and this actually, this definition, this goes way back to when I was in college you know, decades ago when I had an assignment in the class, Christian ministry class. I first said, okay, let's look at Jesus to learn what it means to disciple, right? So we mm. say we're disciples of Jesus, but then Jesus is discipling the disciples. We call them mm. disciples, right? Well, what did he do? And so listen to this. He he intentionally shared life with them. Next I have modeling. So 
he's modeling, he's showing them, so you observe, um, guiding them, naming them, which is, that's a little bit of insider language uh, <laughs> that I use, explain in the book and in the class, but it's in essence, um, yeah, calling out uh, what someone is, their potential to be in, in God, in Jesus. Guiding them, exhorting them, and learning from the Bible and spirit together. So we're walking together. The discipler points disciples to resources for learning, mentors them in practices, values, and character, and gives them opportunities to learn by doing, training them so they can train others. Mm. And that last point, that goes back to in the first episode, I, I mentioned that I, I grew up the son of a camp director, and my father's philosophy was... Um, he saw camp as first and foremost about the youth, the college age uh, young men that were the counselors. So obviously the camp has to be for the campers. That's what it's right. about. But my father's focus was I want to work with these young men to help them become more Christ-like. So he was giving us the opportunity. So my father didn't do all the speaking. Mm. He didn't run mm. anything. It's like... We're out there leading the Bible studies, you know, we're doing the speaking at the campfires, teaching the crafts, we're learning by doing. So mm -hmm. discipleship is not, and this is where, um, Jeff, when we were talking in break about discipleship, I mean, sometimes discipleship is viewed as a class you take, you mm -hmm. know, in a church. And there's like, I was in a church in Honduras and they had discipleship level one, level two, <laughs> level three, level four, and then like you're done, right? Yeah. And, and so, but, and, and like, that's, That's good, great. right? Like I'm not <laughs> right, against right, that right, at right, all. Right. But discipleship is more than just a little booklet that you work mm -hmm. through. It's it includes that, but it's living, working, yeah, learning through doing and observing. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I as you're talking, I, I I thought about how the word disciple. Another translation is learner, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, in our I don't know, post enlightenment world, our view of learning and, and yeah, just learning is in a classroom is I sit down and there's a teacher up front and they are talking at me and that's how I get information. That's how I learn. That's how I'm formed. And that is a formational process. It's legit. I was a teacher for 10 years, but when we read in the Bible, a learner was someone who learned by doing like you just described. So it's like if I'm trying to become a blacksmith, right, I become a blacksmith's apprentice or disciple. He is a master. I'm his disciple. And I don't just sit in a classroom and he lectures me on how to shape metal. Yeah. Like he goes, OK, watch me. All right. Now you here's the hammer. Now you do it now. OK, now you're doing make sure the temperature's right. He's constantly like guiding me as I'm doing it. And it's like you said, it's more than like, all right, you had your three week blacksmith class. Now you're a blacksmith. It's going to take years of being around this person and you're going to pick up way more from them than just blacksmith skills. It's going to be all yeah. kind of things. And this, this idea, like as you guys are sitting here talking and like kind of like unfolding a little bit more, um, seems to be very counterculture in a lot of ways mm -hmm. in the sense, at least in our context here right. in California, U.S. I mean, let me put it that way in the sense that um, we look, I think, and again, yeah, me, I'm speaking from like as a local pastor, someone who also uh, works in parachurch organization. And oftentimes when I have conversations, like even Mark had mentioned to his like, and you had both mentioned, like discipleship is something that I, like, I consume. And in a sense, I like acquire in knowledge. It's like, oh, I need to learn enough Bible verses. Mm -hmm. um, I can defend my faith when someone comes and tries to push against it. Um, I can repeat certain liturgical prayers, um, like things mm -hmm. like that, right? As opposed to actually like our character being a part of it in a lot of ways. And there has been within certain Christian circles a push toward, again, kind of like of a revival kind of with mm -hmm. it um, from Church Dallas formation. Willard and John Mark Comer kind of stuff mm -hmm. that's going on. But I still think for most people, I think that's usually what they're more so like, oh, yeah, I don't need Christianity because I don't think they see it as a holistic kind of thing and a character kind of forming thing where it's going to transform your life, not just give you head knowledge. And I think mm. oftentimes what people are denying seems to be something more here and intellectual, intellectual yeah. as opposed to like, oh, no, this will actually make you a better parent, a better mom, a better spouse kind of person, a better employee. Anyway, and yeah. I 
to bring this back to what we talked about last time and centered um, church. So I think a, a bounded church, so a fuzzy church doesn't in yeah. a certain sense need either. It's, it's fuzzy. But a bounded church, there's, there's an air of strictness about it, mm. but it's, it, it's the line. And so in a, in a bounded church, it will focus on things that can be measured mm. and things that can yeah. be achieved. Yeah. And so that's either rules that you follow, behavioral things, or beliefs that you affirm to. And so, you know, mm. a bounded church um, is, it doesn't require character growth, yeah. virtues, and formations. And actually, there's, there, there would be, yeah, I want to be careful here because, um, and I appreciate it, you said at the end of last time, John, about, I mean, people that are in bounded churches, fuzzy churches, there's a sincerity there. Yeah. Like, they think this stuff is important. Mm -hmm. Or the fuzzy people, like, we know this judgmental is bad. There's sincerity. But so they're not in a bounded church going to talk against character formation. But the, the paradigm, the way of doing church itself, um, I'd say, hinders it because— mm -hmm. Because say so, think you know what's some virtues, character. It's uh, I mean, think like fruit of the spirit. Mm -hmm. So you know, mm -hmm. being gentle, kind, uh, or or think things about being a generous person. Um, how do you measure that? How you you can't measure that, right? <laughs> right. So mm -hmm. uh, and and so it's not part of the line. Mm -hmm. um, so you can measure tithe. You know, like okay, you have to do this much or you're not in. But to be the character of generosity. But now we go the other side, a centered church. Um, so it not only creates space for it because we can talk in a centered church about character and virtues because we're back to you know jeff's question from last time you know what's your next step mm. we can keep asking that how are you becoming more, more like jesus. generous yeah. and how are you becoming more like jesus and so it's an ongoing thing um so whereas Bounded will tend to focus on things that are measurable, more rule-based. A centered church creates, I think, greater possibility for character formation, for growth and virtue to be a more um, central, a more fundamental part of what the, the church is. So to say, yeah, when we're talking about discipleship and this learning, living out, again, and, and so I want to be very careful, it's... People talk like I mean any church you go to, they're going to say over oh, Christ centered, right? right. I mean, <laughs> but it, so the language doesn't necessarily um, guarantee that it will be right. lived out in that way. Right. And so, in one sense, yeah, the centered thing is just you know a diagram on a piece of paper. It doesn't make this thing happen, but it facilitates. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting thinking about growing up in church, like transformation wasn't like a priority i think that we talked about it at times and it's like you know you can be but it was like that was more like a one-time event like all right you got saved you raised your hand you did the right thing you're transformed next like versus like okay how are we helping your life on the inside like actually change like are we concerned with how people change Versus, are you externally exhibiting the correct behaviors in public? I mean, right? if I'm completely honest, for me, where it really sunk in and where I saw the disconnect or cognitive dissonance, mm -hmm. whatever you want to describe it as, was like, it, it seemed almost like it was like the, okay, like the gang members who were locked up, incarcerated, found Jesus, and then the life change, or those who were addicted to drugs mm -hmm. and then like had the life change and now are clean. Like, like, oh, it makes sense that their character should be changed for them because mm. they finally got the knowledge that I uh, had. But for me, I'm just, good. I, have I, my, already, I got my yeah. golden ticket to go to yeah. heaven kind of thing. And it's and I think that was like those with the work I do and the people and the time I actually swear I spend my life at it. It's disappointing and it's discouraging, but I actually find more joy talking to the people who recognize their brokenness and and can actually recognize. No, Jesus thing is not just about. Um, trying to get me to heaven and be morally okay before mm. God, right? And I'm not dismissing that, by the way. But in the sense, what it actually is, is like it's helping me, like following Jesus is keeping me clean, not going back to the same addictive cycles mm. and patterns. 
like following Jesus is actually helping me be a parent to my son who I missed out on for years, Mm -hmm. but I'm still showing up like following Jesus is keeping me from literally going back. And I've had these conversations from going back and retaliating and going, killing this other person because they killed my best friend. Mm -hmm. And so it's just disappointing for me when I see we're going down tangent. I apologize, but (laughs) it's just like, I wish more people could grasp that following Jesus really simply is more than just simply as moral kind of checkbox, Mm -hmm. but genuinely is something that is meant to transform and change your life in all different ways. Yeah. I mean, so kind of going along those lines, going back to like the original question of formation. So you just described a certain situation for certain people who they are formed by their environment, Mm -hmm. right? Gang life, drugs, whatever the case may be. So what, are, and I know the answer is because I took your class, but like, what are some you of, can learn something new? Of Jeff. course, I always <laughs> do. But like, what are some of the? I guess we could we could pick three if you have more than three or less. I don't know, but like strongest formational factors from our culture, kind of on a broad sense, in limited to America, um, that you see that we need to be aware of. Okay, so let me, um, yeah, make it. To, to say something, to not just repeat something you heard in class. Right. So I, <laughs> you can I'll, all I'll, you. I'll yeah, do this a little differently. But starting with something I did say in class. So if we're thinking about um, yeah, you know, well, where, where are we headed? And again, in the center, where we're headed, we become more Christ-like. So I say in class, you know, we ask the question, what is, what's hindering us from living as the people God has created us to be? And what are things that can help us live mm. as the people God has created us to be? So, but what I'd like to do is if if we answer that question, on one hand, I'd say, okay, three or four, I'd say, yeah, in society. Um, no, let me say it this way. Okay, well, let's go back to the 80s. I'm an intervarsity mm. staff person, Syracuse University, Cornell University, upstate New York. And if you ask me, okay, what are the strongest cultural factors? Just your question. Mm-hmm. I would say individualism. Um, consumerism, mammon, mm-hmm. money, which is closely related to consumerism, but a little different. And then this, um, yeah, I'd say the spirit of technique, drive for efficiency. All right, mm-hmm. so I would have said that if you'd asked the question back in the 80s. And so you ask me today, um, I still say those things, right? Right. And, and you get them in class. I mean, individualism, mammon, consumerism, this drive for technique, efficiency. But what's the difference today as compared to 1984 when I was in the university. So yeah, to give you a, yeah, we are right now, you know, surrounded by Technology. computers and yeah. screens. And um, the first time I ever used a computer was the, the, the cat, the online catalog in the library at Syracuse university it was, yeah, it was a computer, but I was still like in my apartment, I was still using a typewriter. typewriter. So yeah, like, that's crazy. okay. So, but what's different today <laughs> is digital devices and mm. the internet. And um, so, okay, so we still have these things, individualism, consumerism, mammon, drive for efficiency. But now we have these powerful purveyors of these same factors. Mm. So, so on one hand, I'd still say today, oh, individualism or consumerism, but to not mention digital devices, internet, our phones, or as, yeah, the book we use in class by Felicia Wusan calls mm-hmm. it, you know, digital ecology. Yeah. Then we're missing out on something. And, and, and so this is um, in a couple different ways. So one thing, it's because consumerism was a problem in 1980, but now we're, we are overwhelmed with ads all the yeah. time. Um, so it's, you know, there's, and we can buy stuff. We're just sitting right here at home. We can buy, you know, it's, so it, it has been, um, it is a bigger issue because of these yeah. purveyors, these conveyors of the same factors. Um, but, um, but it's more than that because it's not just that, oh, okay, well, we're getting, you know, we're getting, we're getting washed over more waves of the influence in consumerism and mammon and individualism because we're drenched in this digital ecology. The, um, the medium themselves 
influence as well, right? So right. it's not just, so on one hand, I'm saying, oh yeah, it's more complicated today because we're getting our consumerism through our phones, which are with us all the time. Um, but also, so let me, I'll, I'll work with the efficiency one on right. this. Right, so right. back when in the eighties, I still talked about this, like, <laughs> you know, we are too driven by efficiency. We think if something's efficient, it's the best way to do things. We need to recognize it's one it's one means of, of evaluating what is best. It's mm. not the means. Mm. But now let's go to today. We have efficiency and we have all this technology. So there were, and so what is, what is what's the problem with the spirit of efficiency is it turns humans into becoming more machine-like. Mm. And so we're, we go back to the beginning. What are we trying to do? We're trying to live more as the people God created us to be. Well, if we're becoming more machine-like, that is not who yeah. God created us to be. Yeah. Okay, so now if you were in 1980 working on an assembly line, then that factory, that assembly line is treating you like you're a machine, mm -hmm. right? So this is not something that happened yeah, to, just yeah. with you know Steve Jobs and Bill <laughs> right, Gates. Right. So it's already there. But today, the amount of workplaces that are shaping people to become more machine-like machine -like, yeah. is much greater. So just, yeah. I mean, two examples. If you were working in a warehouse in 1980, you know, they give you your, you know, your slip of paper to go get these things, put them in a box. And if you're in an Amazon warehouse now, they've got your, your little handheld thing mm -hmm. that tells you, I mean, it's, and it's constantly measuring you, telling you where to go. And so I talked about this in class mm -hmm. of how, you know, an Amazon warehouse turns the people into machines. And then after class, a woman came to me and said, you know, I was a FedEx driver mm -hmm. and it was the same thing. She said, we had one of the, I had the little device mm -hmm. and they were always measuring. And she said, like, I, it was just so life draining. I eventually quit. So you feel what's happening is yeah. because of these digital devices, it's not just that they're communicating um, more of the influence. They themselves are also influencing. Yeah. Okay. That was a very long answer to say. <laughs> Yeah, we asked me the three. I'd say no, individualism, you're, you're. consumerism, mammon, efficiency. But I think today we must add in, yeah, this this digital economy, digital devices mm -hmm. as being a really significant shaping factor. Yeah. Can I ask another yeah. detail about one of those yeah. specifically? Because I really did appreciate it a couple of years ago when we took the class of mammon, right? Yeah. Can man. you maybe just speak to that for just a second? Or like if the person's yeah. like, who is mammon? Who's mammon, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, mammon is, so Jesus, when Jesus says, uh, you can neither serve God nor, and the, the word, and I, I don't know. It's, it's an Aramaic, Aramaic word. Thank yeah. you. I was going to say, it's Greek or Aramaic. Yeah. So Jesus in Aramaic said, um, you cannot use the serve word God and mammon. mammon. So you can't serve God and mammon. Um, so sometimes Bible translators leave the word in Aramaic as mammon. Often it gets translated as money mm -hmm. or wealth, mm -hmm. which which is it's fair. Fine, yeah. um, but but I I use the word mammon because when 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 Jesus says that he's personalizing it because you're a slave, you're a servant, either to one master or another, mm -hmm. and so it's it's this uh, yeah, it's a personalized. And so what I think what that means is when Jesus is speaking there, he's not just talking about dollar bills, but this spirit of money okay. that, um, that I think is an enslaving force. And what, yeah. what, what the spirit of money does, because one thing is, yeah, th these paper bills, I mean, that's, it's useful. You need it to buy things or, um, yeah, it's not your paper bills, your Venmo account, but you need yeah. the, 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 these the dollars to buy things. But then there's the spirit of mammon that tells us this is yeah. the most important thing to do is acquire more of this. Yeah. It it tells us this is how we measure people. People mm -hmm. that yeah. have more of it mm -hmm. are more important, they're more worse. successful, they're yeah. better. And it tells us the more you have, your better better your life will be. And I think Jesus and the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament, both um, undermine all those things, expose them as lies. Yeah, I would say, yeah, I think it's key. And all this thinking I have on Mammon comes from uh, Andy Crouch's book, The Life We're Looking For. Yeah, because Life Worth Living is a different book. 
But if you want to know more about this mammon thing, that's like his main one of his main points in the book. Uh, the Life We're Looking For by Andy Crouch. Fantastic. But Luke, he's writing in Greek, and then he writes this Aramaic word. Now, he chose not to translate it. I think that's one thing that we miss. Mm. And so I, I think it would be better if we didn't translate it. I think if we left it as mammon, I think that would get more closer to Jesus' point. And Brian in our training, Brian Ross, another one of our professors, said that, America, American churches are the only place where we try to prove Jesus wrong. We try to serve God and mm. man, right? Because in, 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 in the book, Andy Carr says, Jesus doesn't say you shouldn't. Yeah. He says you can't. Right. It is not possible to serve both. If you're trying to do both, you're only serving man. And you're not actually serving Jesus, right? So um, I forgot what I was going to say. That's okay. I, I just think it's but, just, yeah, I think the conversation... <laughs> Do I, again, I always ask the question when we're doing these podcasts, do I want to <laughs> expose myself too much? Uh, I'll expose a little <laughs> bit. Um, this is less personal, but just the people I'm walking with. Yeah. <clears throat> um, bigger community. So don't be like, oh, that's, he's talking about me. I'm no. not talking about no one specific. But I, I think people don't necessarily th- realize the um, influence that mammon, money, whatever you want to talk about, consumerism, you, if you want to add that in there as well, has on actual people. And how I do believe it is a part of discipleship in this larger conversation Mm -hmm. on how it can claim our allegiance. It can demand things of us. It can cause us to act out of character and behavior. Um, But oftentimes it's always the conversation of how people are very uncomfortable talking about anything that appears to be religious. And then with money actually attached in there and feeling like they need to be two different things. When in reality, I think our inner workings of us following Jesus actually help us better inform how to better use these yeah, things. I mean, it's one of the most talked about topics of Jesus was talking about money and where well, yeah. your treasure is, your heart will be also all that type of stuff. Yeah. So um, it's interesting though, to think that that's one of the things I like how you pointed that one of those things that actually form us though. Yeah. yeah and let to, me, um, go ahead. So, since you mentioned consumerism, I mean, you said, you know, so define, explain mammon, but that I think also we need yeah. to consumerism because, um, so the way I differentiate the two, and I, they overlap, mm-hmm. but I think you know, mammon is is the the the, uh, the economic quantity of money and this sort of worshiping drive we have to mm-hmm. get money. Mm-hmm. Whereas consumerism is that's things we get purchase with money, with money. <laughs> yeah. and they're both um, f- formational in the sense mm-hmm. they form us uh-huh. because consumerism is yeah i mean through ads it's peer pressure in the sense that like you you need to have these things and it's and it's telling us this lie if you get these things your life will be better better Mm -hmm. um and 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 then there's this you know this psychological thing of yeah shame if you don't have them and it so that yeah the the things we get consumerism money is yeah yeah what i heard you saying earlier as far as the difference between the 1980s and now is I would just add the the hyper to the end of those three mm. things. So hyper individualism, yeah. hyper consumerism, hyper efficiency. So like things have become more intensified, and I think the common denominator, like you said, is our digital devices. Mm-hmm. And Song's book is it's called Restless Devices. It's a really good book as well. Um, she does a good job of laying out the digital ecology that we are just swimming in, and. Like the other day, my wife was like, do you think you could go a whole day without, without looking at your phone? And I was just like, why do you got to ask me stuff like that? No, I don't think I could. <laughs> but I don't know. Maybe if I really tried. But what would that do? One day? I don't know. But anyway. Um, yeah, I agree. I think. And the, yeah. on the hyper, it's because. So in one sense, it, as I said before, it's, it's hyper, you know, the consumerism, the individualism. But. But there's also the, a new element of just thinking like so. Mm. Peer pressure is not new, not new right? No. Right. So I'm in high school in the <laughs> in the 70s, and like, you know, if if I wore Wranglers jeans to high school instead of Levi's, like I, I am out. Like, that has I mean, not gone away, by the way. You know, that was so a thing <laughs> um, and yeah, back then, like, yeah, Nike, Puma, they were just sort of coming on the scene. But I mean, everyone in my high school wore. Um, Cons, Converse, Converse sneakers, you know? and that's like, that's what you wear. Okay, so peer pressure was strong then. I felt it, but now you get, you know, 
TikTok, Instagram, mm-hmm. social media. Well, then there's like when I went home, you know, I like and I tell this story. I'm going to teach a class and think about, you know, honor shame culture. Like I would never wore, wear Wrangler jeans to my high school. But, you know, I still have some old Wrangler jeans that, be, you know, from my parents had gotten me before I, you know, said no more of that. But I go home, I'm going to mow the lawn or something. I put on my, my Wrangler, Wrangler jeans. Sure. Like, I'm, this, I'm, I'm free. Like, they're, yeah. but if I'm in social media, it's like it's, hmm. it's with it me 24 hours yeah. a day. It's always telling me, always telling me. So, so there's this, there's this, it is hyper and it's also, yeah, hyper and it's extended. And then there's, there's new things that are happening because of digital Mm -hmm, ecology mm -hmm. um, in that it's a, well, the polarization that we're experiencing Mm -hmm. through algorithms and then it's a disrupting presence. Um, You know, right now we are focused on each other, but if you were using your phone right now, Mm -hmm. it would be pulling you away. It's distracting. And so Mm -hmm. it's, it's a disrupting presence and it, absorbs attention so yeah. so it, it's it's hyper to those things and then there's also these added elements yeah i think um it one of the things that is that is most different but about now versus in the past is like presence is much harder to to maintain mm. like being physically and mentally present because of of this of this is the unique thing in our situation is because of the digital aspect it's, there's a much lower chance that we are mentally present with people. It's true. Right? Like, we all, you know, we go somewhere, and Simon Sinek talks about this in his TED Talk. Like, if you put your phone on the table, even if I put it face down, like, that's still, it's still, like, yep. is is drawing, taking my presence away from, like, the people I'm with. Well, and right? it communicates to the other yeah. people. Yeah, exactly. And it communicates to me. If that rings, yeah, I'm out. Okay, so, you're uh, you're not as high a priority yeah. for me, even though I'm actually with you, right? And rings, there we go. I'm from the 20th century. It, it still <laughs> ring. I still call it a ring. Anyway, um, so so I guess yeah. I'm, I'm curious. Then we've identified maybe some of the things yeah. that help that are forming right. us, whether we're uh, aware of it or not. Um, so what are some of the ways in which we can combat maybe? Yeah, some and of I mean, these like number one. Should we should this be a priority of something that we should be combating? Yes. Yeah. So, um, okay. So yeah, and boy, I have all these. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go back to, like, this is, this is not about finger pointing. Should, mm. right? So, um, and that's why when, in my ethics class, I mean, I start by talking about a God of loving grace that mm-hmm. gives us ethical direction. Talk about centered set church because this is not about, okay, stop letting money be the most important <laughs> thing in your life. It is Jesus out of loving concern tells us you can't serve God and mammon. Yeah. And this is not a, this is not a good slave master. Right. Don't go this way. So we're, we're talking about this because Go the way of Jesus and seek to resist and look for alternative these things is a better place to be. Okay, so that was one of the many things that <laughs> no, crossed my that. mind. Um, so, so then, but on the on the how, um, this gets back to. Well, let me tell the story. So when I, I again back at university staff in the '80s, Syracuse University, um, and so it was a relatively small group, sort of struggling. Um, and we're, yeah, so I'm trying to figure out, like, what do we do? And so, you know, we have Bible study thing once a week, and then we'd have what we call our large group meeting Friday night, and people would come. And there were some, yeah, people in the group, you know, leaning in, good, walking with us. And I'm trying to disciple them, right? I'm trying to shape them. But I remember walking around on campus and thinking, you know, these students, I'm with them for a mm-hmm. few hours a week, and then they are hours and hours yeah. being shaped by society being shaped by Syracuse University being shaped by their peers I, I like I'm not getting enough and so that um, the last year I was on staff when my wife and I decided to rent a big house I mean we were just like in a one bedroom apartment so we go rent this four bedroom house mm-hmm. and we invited three students to live with us mm-hmm. and we're going to do discipleship now to go back to where we start so what's what's the difference there mm-hmm. is um, 
you know, we're in the kitchen together in the morning. They come, they come back from their classes. We're there. We go out. They see my wife and I interacting. So if you feel discipleship, it's not just that we're doing a study of mm-hmm. their head on Wednesday night. We're living together. And we thought that was necessary in 1980. Wow. Um, okay, so now here, uh, borrowing from another podcast, so I, um, I, yeah, I didn't talk a whole lot about discipleship in the, yeah, the actual mentoring walking with in my ethics class very much. It was a title that I inherited, and I thought, well, why would we talk much about en- mentoring in here? It's about ethics. <laughs> um, then you know, one Saturday morning, I was, um, you already mentioned Brian Ross, and he had recommended to me this Cultural Moment podcast oh, by was John Mark it is good. Comer Mark and Mark Sayers. Sayers. Maybe. And, um, and so the two of them are talking about, they're reflecting on, in the early 2000s, there's church planters, and they're, they're trying to be relevant. And so, and it, it was a great line. They said something like, yeah, you know, we, we're turning down the lights and sitting in a circle, you know, maybe have some candles and like, yeah, we're like it, it, it was good stuff. And like people are coming, but then one of them said, you know, we worked so hard at being relevant that in the end, the people in our churches, like the, there was so little difference between us and society that mm. it, 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 yeah, it people were not becoming more Christ-like because our focus is on being relevant and being making this connection. So then um, they say, so what we need to do today is discipleship. And I, w- I was working my garden, transplanting lettuce. I, just, I literally put down, you know, my thing, lean back, and they caught my attention, discipleship. And then they said, because we need to be shaping people in just basic practices mm. of um you know prayer reading their bible but not just what we might think of sort of yeah I, traditionally spiritual things but like you know we need to be eating together mm-hmm. and we need to be helping people um talking interacting yeah, with each other like being with each other and so i i go in on um yeah and i thought back to what i'd done in the 80s in our varsity so that on monday morning i go in and talk to brian ross whose office is right next to mine and i tell him i've been listening to the podcast he recommended so i said well brian you know do you agree with them that like this is the discipleship is more important now more required and he was the one that said to me he said mark yeah when you when you had those people back in the 80s at least when they went into their dorm rooms you know they're it's just them but now he said they they got their phone. Society is with us all, all the, time, the time, always. So he said discipleship, this sense of walking with people, thinking about formation, input, molding, it is so much more important. And so that's when I realized in this ethics class, we could talk about okay, let's resist consumerism, but this is not something you can do on your own. Right. And so this is part of walking with people um is working at these things and so it's both ways so discipleship includes talking about consumerism Mm -hmm. talking about our phones talking about digital ecology and at the same time if we are going to live in freedom of those things we need to be walking with others discipling being discipled that's that's uh, yeah sorry this little insert that's wisdom right there i'm just sitting here like thinking i'm like the initial question, I think someone, yeah, I'll be honest, my age range probably would respond like, yeah, you need to make sure that you don't have your phone out and all these things. But just to think that actually, like, really what is actually needed to combat mm-hmm. those things is the presence of community around us yeah. in which now those practical behaviors can also be implemented through there. Yeah, something that my wife and I have continue, will continue to talk about is, like, you know, putting our kids in school. And it's like, you know, they're going to be with us for far less time than they are with people at school Mm -hmm. and that's going to be more formational than than us which is a scary thought and so you amplify that to like like you said society that line society is with us all the time is something that like i'm definitely using in a sermon because it's just it's just like yeah i don't think we talk about that enough like and i i've been saying this a lot and i'm gonna be annoying in our church is just my role but it's just like <laughs> annoying yeah <laughs> Not a little bit but it's just like if we don't talk about like 
how you are being formed all the time. More than it, like, like I said, Sunday is not enough. No. Two hours on a Sunday and maybe two Bible hours study, on a Wednesday you come to prayer, you come to everything. is not enough yeah. compared to the hours that you are expending being formed yeah. by your screens. Right. I think uh, I have a book there, Faith for Exiles mm-hmm. by uh, David Kinnaman, the guy who's in charge of um, Barna. Yep. And the, the, the main point of the book is screens disciple. That's like his whole argument. And this, that was written in 2019. That's before the pandemic. So it's gotten even more intense since then. But it's just like, if we don't understand, it's not just a young person thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, my parents, they listen to this podcast. My mom's on Facebook all the time. Like, they're, they're, they're on their screens too. They, they have, they're being inside by their screens. They're in their 60s. Like, this is a, this is a, everybody who's alive right now is going through the same issue of like yeah. being discipled by our screens. And it's like, okay. So do I only watch Christian content on my screen? Is that going to help? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> this podcast counts. Let's watch that. <laughs> but I mean, I yeah, I just think it's something that we are going to look back on in 10, 20 years and be like, wow, like that we needed to. I think we either we, we addressed it or like, wait, we missed that. That was huge. Yeah. Can I make an you observation? Know? Yeah. I think, though, because, um, yeah, I think I definitely would affirm that community we could use it just really bluntly like community is a solution sure yeah. combating but if i can make the observation i think a lot of people including myself can be in that category that um like intimacy can be kind of like fearful like it can be scary in the sense of allowing someone to come into my life trusting that there are going to be uh people who are not judgmental or mm-hmm. going to air out my trash or gonna just basically be there just to j- like point all the fingers like all that kind of stuff it feels like i don't know how comfortable a lot of people are when we use the language even like what community looks like i think often people like there's a fearfulness that comes well, with it private property yeah. how our suburbs mm-hmm. are actually developed i'm gonna go there we don't have uh well it depends on if you live in like my neighborhood or actually like in uh, jackson or stuff like that like we have front porches we don't have mm-hmm. front porches everyone's mm-hmm. in the backyard and trying to intentionally mm-hmm. you got self check out at grocery stores versus like talking to people um dang man you were saying something i was gonna say Sorry. something and it, I'll it just, just me. um so <sighs> when you said community yeah i think let's be let's be concrete so wh- what are we how community because yes, um good. just Hanging out, eating together, sharing, that's community. That's really good. But when we're talking about these things, these issues, I think, so we need community in the sense that we can't resist these things alone. Yeah. So, and and this is true with the current digital thing, but it's also true with the others. Because if society, if everything around me is telling me money is the most important thing, well, where am I going to get counter ideas? And where am I, I, I need someone to be, honoring me by saying that is a beautiful thing mark that you shared some of your resources with this other people like so i need those voices but if we come to this i think community so this is where i'd like to um yeah commend um mark scandrett and john mark homer you know of working on practicing the way of jesus and they've they've both gone you know, very concrete and practical. And so in my Center Set Church book, I, I share some idea, ideas that, from Mark Scandrett of saying, you know, with a group of people do, and he, he has these like, um, yeah, experiential things. Mm. So say, okay, for the next two weeks, um, you know, when I encounter people, I'm going to think, this person is created in the image of God. And I'm going to work at this intentionally. So, so we're working at presence here. So, mm-hmm. But then we're going to come together and say, okay, what was your experience on that? Um, or to say, um, you know, I'm going to and we're going to go different ways with money, ma'am. And so one is, you know, I'm going to try to not spend any money for the next two weeks Um uh, or, you know, or outside of, I don't know, however, but you come up with something, you know, this, this amount and not above that, or make any purchases beyond food, something like that. Mm-hmm. But again, it's, it's the experience. You come together and reflect on it. Um, or to go the other way mm-hmm. of say this week, I'm going to try to be especially generous. Mm-hmm. And what do you observe? Um, 
Or like we do in class, of say, take yeah. a fast from your yeah, telephone. What fantastic. what do you observe? So yeah, when I, when when you say community, it's not just sort of okay, let's get together with some other people and it's automatic, but community with intentionality Intention. yeah. of working at these things and working at them together, having conversation, and then we can support each other and yeah. yeah. So it came back to me. So. Our society, you said intimacy is scary for people in your generation, right? I would say that's by design. Like our society, our culture is like anti-intimacy, right? There are things built in that that tear that apart. And then when we look at bounded, fuzzy, and centered, bounded church, intimacy is an enemy. You can't know what's going on because you're going to know if I'm crossing the line or not. So like I think that goes back to like we need centered church to help people like learn how to have intimacy because i think intimacy is vital to discipleship and following jesus right um and i and i think yeah like like being able to like have this intentional community where we do things together and i think john mark says we don't learn from experience we learn from reflecting on our experience mm -hmm. and so that was one thing i've that's one of the main things i've learned from seminary is we in almost every class we have to reflect on ourselves and our <laughs> thinking and how we're feeling but it's been really helpful because I'm like, yeah. okay, like it's it's trained me to do it all the time. Like, okay, like why did I feel that way when X, Y, and Z happened or when so-and-so said something to me or whatever? Like, so I, and I think another thing that our culture is against is self-awareness. Um, I think it loves self-consciousness. Like people, oh, people looking at me, am I wearing the right stuff? Like, because you can be exploited if you're self-conscious, but if, Self, as Brian talked about in, in the training last mm -hmm. week, self awareness, self knowledge, is rare, and it's like that's what's really important. That's that's part of being a disciple. Is like, okay, why am I like this? Why yeah. am I doing this? You know, um, and being able to name that in people and call that out in people, I think is is key. Yeah. But um, yeah. as we get close to concluding our time with Dr. Mark Baker. I want to be able to give him a final word if anything he wants to share about uh, regarding this topic, regarding Center Set Church, um, maybe some upcoming things that are happening to kind of cast out there for people who want to follow you, um, anything like that. Great. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, so I just want to repeat where we ended last time of saying the key in all of this is who God is. Mm -hmm. And so as we're talking about this, we have a God that loves us and therefore out of love is calling us to not go the way of mammon, consumerism, mm -hmm. efficiency. So that's one thing. Then the other thing, uh, a couple other things, um, is to, to feel how the centered set model relates to all this. Because even as, as you were talking, Jeff, um, yeah, I was thinking, yes, and so intimacy in a centered uh, community, the, a community of that character, there's not the shame threat of being found out mm -hmm. because we're all acknowledging we are on a journey. We haven't arrived. We're, we, we, we all have lack, so we can share and be honest about that. The key thing is which direction are you headed? Mm. Um, so that and then yeah lastly just to, to give uh a book plug on a a, a different book related to center ch church is the um book you mentioned on galatians so i this came out after centered set church um freedom from Relig religiosity and judgmentalism study in paul's letter to the galatians so what i what i try to do in this book uh, a couple different things is one and then there's some there's some Bible in the Centered Set Church mm -hmm. where I try to get, you know, where do we see this in Jesus? But this uh, book on Galatians, it's more, if you, if you like a biblical basis mm -hmm. of this, okay, Mark, and what you, you said, Hebert borrowed this from math, where's it coming from? It's just, so yeah, this book in Galatians gets, yeah, deep, profound, biblical basis example of what I call Centered yeah. Set Church in Galatians. And it's um it's a commentary but it's meant for lay people. They told me the series it's in like no footnotes allowed. <laughs> it has um, <laughs> has study, you know, reflection questions yeah. for a group study at the end of each chapter. So um it's I view it as a way of both um 
going deeper on centered set church, but also through the lens of bounded and centered, I think understanding Galatians in a better way as well. Yeah. And, I will affirm. Um, so, and just lastly, thanks. It was great with being with both of you mm. and I've yeah, listening to your, for having listened to your podcast, I came today with, uh, yeah, very positive attitude because I knew you would make it fun and interesting. So thank you. Man. Appreciate it. And uh, we ask as tradition now, yeah. I've, I guess. If, John uh, started the tradition. I sure started the tradition. So, so can, we always ask our guests who come on if they can clo- conclude in prayer for us and however you want. So Okay, yeah. let's pray. God, we are grateful that you are a God of love. And I ask that John, Jeff, and myself, and all those listening or watching may be especially aware of their belovedness today and from a place of love, may we be sensitive to ways you are calling us to take a next step, a next step in growing in character and virtue and resisting the alienating forces in society that hinder us from living more fully as the people you've created us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Mark, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Appreciate your time. This was everything I hoped it would be. Great. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, and uh, we're just, yeah, I know you're going to be moving across the country to Maine. Um, Your daughter hasn't had her her child yet. No, July. Okay, yeah, we're praying for that, and um, yeah, man, like Please stay in touch. I'm gonna be following your blog, mm-hmm. so I'm I, I know I'll have that. But like, just people can actually. How do you what do you describe it? Like how you can I subscribe. Know, subscribe is that the right yeah. word? Mm-hmm. Discipleshipandethics.com. So yeah. all written together. Discipleshipandethics.com, and I yeah do a again air quotes monthly <laughs> blog. So but hopefully in retirement yeah. it really will be monthly. Yeah. So but enjoy it, man, and and you have earned it and. Yeah, I know I'm just grateful and proud to have learned from you. And yep. um, I always tell you, like, you made seminary worth it. And so, like, yeah, I mean, people are like, is seminary good? I'm like, I got to learn from Mark Baker. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> Moving forward, it'll be fine. I'm, I'm good. So thank you. Thank you, sir. And, uh, yeah, you guys have a good rest of your whatever. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday. Because this is going to come out in June, this one that we just mm-hmm. finished. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. We'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. Later.